Okay, so I just want to let folks know that uh, there'll be links to reference articles and a recording of this at this location. Uh, Tony Mayo, does it show my arrow? It doesn't, but you can see that. Okay, and uh, there aren't many of us, so if you can just speak right up and ask your questions, that's fine, but I got the chat window up as well. And we'll show you how to use that chat window. We'll just keep moving. So we talked before about uh, how breakthroughs can seem very dramatic and sudden, like the implosion of a building. But what this dramatic breakthrough conceals is the tremendous knowledge <laughs> and insight that is required to have that sudden dramatic event. So that's the kind of breakthrough we're talking about here that you can have in your own life and in your own career, whereby really understanding the structure that you're in, doing a lot of preparation, putting those charges in just the right places, having the timing set up perfectly, you can, in an instant, restructure a big part of your life. But it doesn't just happen uh, because of a few minutes intention it requires a good deal of insight and preparation, but then things can move very quickly. As I tell my new clients, don't expect much to change for the first six months or so, but then suddenly dramatic things can happen. So let's talk today about what goes on in those uh, six months of executive coaching, setting you up for your first of many, many breakthroughs. I discussed one of the time the concept of the clearing, which I really crystallized for me when I was visiting uh, Shenandoah National Park, not far from here in Virginia, uh, where the ranger was telling us about this area called Big Meadows. Now, Shenandoah in general is surrounded by forest, but it's fairly new forest because unlike those areas out west where the government found a beautiful piece of land and just sort of put a fence around it, Shenandoah was reclaimed farmland and homestead, and they just let it go natural and the trees came up. Well, the ranger was showing us around this 80 acres of big meadow, saying it had been a meadow for, as far as they could tell, about a millennium. Whoa, a thousand years, long time. So I raised my hand and I said, what is it about this particular area inside the forest that keeps it a meadow? A meadow? Is it the geology, a microclimate, what? She said, well, we mow it twice a year. <laughs> and I said, well, that, that handles the most recent 50 years. But what about that 950 before that? And she said that the Native American hunter-gatherers that had lived there would clear the land and then periodically burn it to keep it a meadow. They did this because deer was very important to their survival. And essentially, there's two ways for a Stone Age group to get the deer that they need. They can get very stealthy and clever and work their way through the woods, trying to get close enough to a deer to, you know, harvest it. Or they can create an environment that's attractive to the deer that they need. And by creating a meadow in a forest, the deer come out to feed on the young shoots and grasses that grow there. And then you're free to uh, harvest it at a time and place of your convenience. So the principle here is that by creating clearings that attract the things we want, we can live a life of harvesting instead of a life of chasing through the woods, hoping to catch something and then dragging it back. So what do clearings attract? Well, it's very easy to know what the clearing you're creating in your life attracts right now. It attracts what you're getting. I know it's a tautology, but sometimes a tautology is an insight. Whatever you're experiencing in your life on a repeated basis, good things and bad things, you can take responsibility that you've created a clearing. The characteristics of which clearing are attracting what you're getting. Now, if you want to attract something else, if you want to get something else, a foundational way of dealing with it is to change the clearing that you're creating. One of the easiest ways to create a clearing that attracts something different is to change your facial expression. Now, my resting automatic facial expression is not one that attracts interaction. Mine almost creates a cone of repulsion so that people don't interfere with me when I'm out and about getting stuff done. 
But I find, and I had to discover this over and again, that if I have a more open posture and a smile with eye contact, strangers smile back. Store clerks talk to me. We engage in conversations. We learn things. We build relationships. Just that subtle change in my face, maybe in my body posture, is a clearing that attracts different things into my life. And you can make adjustments like this all through your life. I talked last time about an office I visited that struck me as being a place of efficiency, a place where things got done and nothing was wasted. But I couldn't put my finger on what it was about it that caused that. Well, when I met with the CEO, this was a company that sold mainframe computers to the government. And he wanted to convey this impression of efficiency, of no waste, but reliable results. But he didn't want to spend money on plush offices, anything fancy, high tech, because that could look expensive to a government buyer, wasteful. So what he did was made sure the place was immaculately clean every day, all day, that the carpets were shampooed every six months, replaced every four years, that the walls were painted fresh every year. So it wasn't expensive, it wasn't wasteful, but it was clean, it was crisp. It was an environment where work got done. That's the clearing he created. Just like this clearing can uh, attract deer out where they can be harvested. So far, so good. Any questions, concerns, insights, places you might want to apply it in your own life? No, all good. All good. All right. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Looking over Facebook. All right. All right. Tom Heights was able to type it in manually. Yeah, well, I got a first timer on Facebook Live. Welcome, Terry. I'm glad you took the time. And if you want to interact more, ask me some direct questions. I won't be watching the Facebook Live all the time, but I will be paying attention on the Zoom that you can get to from TonyMayo.com slash Tuesdays. All right, one more piece of review. A big part of the clearing, a foundational practice is to notice that you are interpreting events that we don't particularly react to what's happening, we are reacting to how what's happening fits in with our model of the world. And not only are you interpreting events, but you can be responsible for how you interpret those events. If you wanna get really powerful, realize that everyone else is interpreting events and not necessarily responding to exactly what you're doing, least of all, your intentions and that you can be responsible for how they are interpreting your actions, your communications. That's powerful leadership. Instead of retreating to some explanation or repetition of our intentions, what we meant, what we hoped, what we were trying to communicate, we can notice what communication people are actually receiving from us and be responsible for the way we communicate, the time we communicate, a very powerful stand in this regard is to take on that the meaning of my communication is the response I get. Think about how you would behave differently if when the response you got to one of your communications wasn't what you wanted, instead of retreating to your intentions, to repeating yourself, to explaining yourself, you took this as information about the filter through which they're listening to you. So if I announce a policy at work that I think would be motivating to employees, that would improve retention, and I get rumors of grumbling or indifference, doesn't necessarily useful for me to come out and say, I'm trying to do something nice. I'm trying to help you. Something's clicking. There's a chat. There's something in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, Terry, you got it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. He's saying from the point of view of a bank where he spent a lot of his life uh, working in banks and the school he's done so much work for, the first impression as folks enters our space 
What is it? He's hoping it's open, fresh, and welcoming. It can be very useful, Terry, to notice how people walk in. Just hang out in that lobby, that main entrance. See what people do. Are they coming in and scratching their heads and wondering where to go next? There may be some wayfinding that's necessary. Uh, would it be useful to have someone there actually said hello? Some environments, that puts people off. They want a chance to orient themselves on their own. Other places, it's a relief. Oh, thank goodness, there's a human I can talk to. But again, the meaning of what's communicated by, in this case, the lobby of your school or your business is how people react to it. The meaning of a communication is the response. Not like it's true, just as something that might be useful for you to act on. Let's go on to a further explanation of some of these concepts. I tend to think that uh, the information that comes to us through our senses, we tend to treat as what is. You know, there's this ball of the world that where things are happening, things are said, seen, felt, heard, smelt, touched. And we tend to think we're reacting to what is, but it's not that simple. Because all of us have this thick layer, a distorting filter that consists of what you already know. You know, Gödel changed the world in the early 1900s with his incompleteness theorem. And essentially what that said for our purposes is, nothing is a complete set of information. We're always bringing some assumptions, some tools, some methods and ideas from outside the system to help us understand what's in the system. And as teachers and leaders, building those bridges and connections from what they already know to what we're trying to teach is very useful, necessary, a positive thing to be considering. But first we have to notice that there is a filter. No two people are gonna walk into that bank lobby or school entrance and see and experience the same thing because they have a different thick distorting filter of what I know. So this puts us pretty far away. There's this little area of what is. There's a thick distorting filter of our assumptions, our beliefs, our expectations, our hopes, our fears mostly fears for most of us most of the time, the things we know we've learned that we're bringing into this experience. And then there's this little crust, and that's where we're coping with the world most of the time. We think we're dealing with that little dot in the center, but more often we're trying to interact with that little crust on the edge. That is so thin. This is not a scale drawing. This is sort of one of those drawings you see of the solar system where they say if it was really to scale, and the sun was that size, the earth would be out in the other room somewhere. Yeah, it's kind of like that with this too. The, the filter is so thick that you almost wouldn't see that dot of what is. And you know, a lot of the time we don't see that dot of what is. We're just dealing with that little crust on the outside. It's like the atmosphere of the earth to use another astronomical example. I heard an interview with an astronaut recently. He said, being in space, what is one of the insights you notice about life on earth that really impress you, that changes the way you go about things, that changes, as I think about it, what he knows, that thick filter of how he looks at the world. And this is what he said. Watching the sun come around the earth when you're in space, you're struck by this very thin layer of atmosphere in which everything humans do except for space travel and undersea, everything happens and has happened for humans in this little layer called the atmosphere. That atmosphere is so thin on the earth that proportionately the skin of an apple is thicker than the atmosphere. Think about that. If the earth were the size of an apple, the atmosphere would be thinner in the skin of that apple. So that's the kind of thing that can change your attitude about taking care of the air, of being cautious about the earth. So let's talk about this filter. 
this filter that changes so much of what we deal with. Another term for this worldview that philosophers use is the world view. We all have a view of how things work, what matters, what's for us, what's against us, what's beautiful, what's repulsive. All these opinions, ideas, things to protect ourselves, driven often by fears, but sometimes by hopes and aspirations. It still distorts our view of reality. Sometimes that's a very useful distortion. For example, there's this wonderful experiment where people were brought in and asked to control a light bulb. They had a switch. They said, when that light bulb comes on, try to turn it off as quickly as you can. What they didn't realize is that the switch wasn't connected to the light bulb. The light bulb was going on and off at random. Switch did nothing. But the point of it was, these people had also been screened for depression. The people who are clinically depressed were much more likely to realize that they had no control over the light bulb. The healthy normals believed that they had a system that they clicked fast enough or repeatedly enough or after the proper pause. They all had these schemes for how they believed they could to some degree control that bulb. They're completely wrong. But you know what? That attitude that the world works in a way that we can influence leads to a better life, a happier life. People who are depressed may be right about how much control they have over the world, but it doesn't give them what they want. It just makes them more believe that it's hopeless, that they don't control anything, that you shouldn't bother, just give up. That's the definition of being depressed. So reality, ain't always cracked up to be. That's why we love leaders who see things that don't exist. Leaders who've been to the mountaintop, who've seen the promised land and can tell us what it could be like for us. It doesn't exist, it's made up. But if we act in a manner consistent with this world that's visualized, imagined by a compelling, good communicating leader, we have a better life now. Taking action towards creating the world we want gives us a better chance of living in that world. Right now, win or lose. Let's take apart this idea of the worldview if we're convinced that the worldview matters, if it makes a big difference. I'll bring in some more philosophical terminology. Historical discourse. This is the idea concept. It's a distinction. It's not the truth. Nothing I say is true. It's just ideas that you can decide whether they work or not, whether they're useful for you or not. Historical discourse, based on the idea that we are continually involved in a discourse, in some sort of conversation, a back and forth, an interaction with the world and the people in the world. In many discourses, began before we arrived. We are continually, always, already, walking into a movie that has started. You know how you walk into a room and someone's watching TV and the show seems kind of interesting? And you kind of, kind of catch up with it, but you're not sure whether you're catching up with a farce or a drama. Is this science fiction or a documentary? You have to learn some of the rules, some what's the clearing here? Because this is a historical discourse this movie you walked in on. It started before you got there. So it's a discourse in the sense it's an interaction, it's a conversation, but it's historical in that it started before you participated. All of us have joined these historical discourses, some more important than others. One of the most important is the historical discourse on what it means to be a family because our parents, maybe our siblings, our extended family, the village, the community, they all were having a conversation about what it meant to take care of a baby, to bring someone into the world, to raise a child. That discourse started way before you showed up, but now you're in it, you're interacting with it. You show up at work 
at a new company. That company is a discourse, it's a conversation. And it was going on before you got there. And you're trying to figure out what worldview runs this. What are the rules here? How do I make an impact? How do I protect myself? So there's always, already, a filter that the people around us are using. And it's a different one than ours. What's the point of pointing this out? Well, what makes a distinction useful, what gives a distinction any value, is how it can influence the actions we take to move us closer to or isolate us from the future that we intend to create. That's the idea. Well, if I'm showing up at a new company as a consultant, as an employee, as a vendor, I want to pay attention to how people communicate, how they respond to different circumstances. Are they nervous when they're brought together for an all-company announcement? Or are they excited when they have an all-company announcement? When they see an email from their supervisor outside work hours, is that stressful? Or is that possibility for action? And once we learn the filters that other people are using, then we have more of an opportunity to choose our own reactions to, uh, I'm cheating, I'm looking at the wrong slide, I'm getting back to, there we go, that's the one I wanted to show you, is, you know, there's a filter there all the time, as an idea, as a possible concept. Again, none of this is true, this is not physics we're talking about. These are tools we can use for our own uh, improvement. If they don't work, they don't work, move on. But if we start with the idea that people have a filter, then we can start working with it. It's what I know, what they know. For instance, when I start with a new CEO client, one of the things I do is get an agreement that I can have a confidential conversation with four to eight people who know this person well. And she gives these employees, spouses, whatever, permission to speak freely with me because it's confidential. I'm not evaluating anyone. I'm not bringing back a report. I'm just using this to understand, to some degree, just the background, so I know what the stories are that people are telling, you know, what the context. But more important, I'm getting a picture of the cumulative thick distorting filter that people are relating to this person with. You see, everyone you interact with, everyone that CEO interact with, has a somewhat different filter. But if we get all those filters together and compare them, there's going to be commonality. And that common filter that the people around each of us has for interpreting our communications and our actions, well, we call that a reputation. And our reputation has a huge impact on what we can accomplish with a particular action. I had one client, not the CEO, was head of a, a division in a consulting firm, who had a reputation of being a bit of a bully, of having kind of a chip on his shoulder, of always proving that he knew more than everyone else. He was very distressed by this because people didn't want to work on his projects. And he didn't like being seen as a bully, as a troublemaker, as someone who made folks uncomfortable. When his intention was, he wanted to help people. He wanted them to learn. He wanted them to do excellent work. He wanted to point out where their deliverables were weak, where their process had gaps. And he was doing this so they would get better, become more valuable, more effective. But because of his reputation as being a know-it-all and being argumentative and feisty, people couldn't get that contribution. And this was made even harder for him because he happened to work with one of those people, we've all met them, who's just so engaging, so charming, their, that his boss's filter was, this is a nice guy who's going to look out for me. This boss could say outrageous things, things that if anybody else said them, it'd be, it'd be a lawsuit. So I had this subordinate who had a difficult reputation. And if he said anything, the least bit not encouraging, supportive, politically correct, would be vilified. Watching and trying to emulate a boss who got away with saying ridiculous things because his way of being had created a filter, a worldview among his employees that he's a nice guy, he's for me. 
So what did we do? Well, my client became more aware of the mannerisms that supported this unfortunate filter. He literally would relax his shoulders. He noticed when he was feeling tense, worked up, excited. He'd keep his hands down, he'd breathe more deeply. He relaxed his forehead and pointed out the same errors, demanded the same high level of performance, explained to people the same taxing, difficult techniques for getting great work. And after a couple of years, he was the most in-demand consulting manager at that place. Everyone wanted to work with him because they knew they would get better because they knew the boss was out for them, was for them trying to give them a good life. That's one of the values of being aware of this thick distorting filter that we all deal with. Once you know what it is, you can start to deal with it. And it takes a long time to move a reputation with a given group of people, especially one with reputations that you're a little bit threatening, somewhat dangerous. Anytime he wasn't aware of his posture, of his tone of voice, of how he introduced his corrections, he would lose weeks of, of credit. He said, oh yeah, there he goes again. That's a, that's a. And you'd have to build it back step by step by step. But after a couple of years, his reputation got pretty strong so he could, he could make a few uh, mistakes now and then. That's what we're get going for here, is to, number one, notice, we are creating a clearing all the time. That clearing affects how people interpret our actions and other communications. And when we get clear what that is, how it's operating, we can start to shift it and become much more effective at getting the results we want. And that's after all is what communication is for. We communicate to make things happen. It's not transferring data from one cranium to another. That's pointless. It's to make something happen. So of course, if you start from, here's what I want to have happen, what would be a clearing that would be support, supportive of that? Because hey, sometimes getting angry and blowing up is the appropriate response. Not because you deserve to, but because that'll get the result you're looking for. Yeah. And what I say in those circumstances is, that's not anger using me, taking me over like an emotion, like a wave of weather that I can't control. No, that's me using anger. I went through a lot of negotiations and disappointments with the folks who worked on my home theater. I know, first world problem. But I went through a lot of trouble getting that darn thing set up the way I wanted it set up to the point where we're at a tremendous impasse. And, and then I said, okay, it's time to get angry. And I used the fact that I was taller than him, that I wanted to get louder, that we're in my ter on my turf. And I used the anger to get him towards the outcome that I thought was correct. But I wasn't uh, worked up, disturbed, upset later on. It was just noticing the anger was one of the possible responses available to me. It was genuine. And rather than suppress it or channel it, which, which would be appropriate in many other circumstances, that time I decided to let it rip. And it worked. It's a, it becomes a choice. And that's really what all my coaching is about. I'll probably wrap up on this thought. It's to explore that gap between stimulus and response and make that a little bit longer so that I consider what I'm up to. And I'm not just reacting based on my historical discourse, on my assumptions, what I've learned, how my dad would have reacted, how I've seen my boss react, what I made it mean about from that leader I saw on TV. No, I'm stopping saying, okay, this I just noticed. I still have a commitment and now I can behave in a different way. All right, let's see. Anything up on the comments on Facebook or on Zoom? All right, well, I would like to, to wrap up uh, with any questions, uh, any comments, and particularly if there's some opening for action out of today's conversation, if there's someone you're going to talk to, if there's a communication you're going to have based on this distinction, I'd love to hear about it now. So uh, who has something to, to say? Either uh, type it into the chat window or to just come on verbally. No, this is very, very timely because I do have an um, important call this afternoon. And um, so I was listening intently and now can see how I can 
um, make sure that this phone call has the better outcome. Yeah. has a much more positive outcome. Right. And that yeah. reminds me of the, the instruction that I've shared with many of you. I learned it from Sandler Sales. And that's when you get someone on the phone, it can be useful to say, it sounds like maybe I caught you at a bad time. Mm -hmm. And that does a number of things. One, it sort of disrupts the, the routine so that they're not just operating on autopilot. They actually take a moment and say, hmm, I wonder why they thought this. So they're becoming more self-aware. And they have to think, well, what impression did I want to give this person on the phone? So it's an invitation to this untrained person on the other side of the phone to think about, well, what am I committed to? Why am I on this call? What impression do I prefer to give? And so many times I hear people uh, relax or become more attentive. Uh, I don't hear so many clicks in the background after mm -hmm. I say something like that. So these are all little cues to help people uh, get out of their automatic responses based on history and focus on their intention. All Thank right, you. all right, uh, Terry, Tom, anyone else want to give me a concluding thought before I wrap up for today? Okay, so uh, next time we'll be uh, talking more about what I call the express lane towards, uh, towards breakthrough. And uh, we'll see you all then, I hope. Thank you, Tony. All right. Bye, Jane. Terry. Kent, Kara, thanks for being with us. And I hope you'll join me next time. All right. I see something else in the chat window. What's going on here? All right. Yeah. Terry, we're all still learning. That's how we know we're alive. Otherwise, we just turn into meat machines, I think. <laughs> All right, I'm going to end today's meeting. I'll see you all next time.